Good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name is Cheryl Reynolds. I'm from the UC statewide IPM program. Today, I'm um, at home in Sacramento, and uh, Peter Cosina is also here on the line, and he is uh, at his home in Richmond. Um, welcome to today's webinar from Integrated Pest Management to Integrated Pest and Pollinator Management, an update on current research on pollinator health. And so now I would like to introduce our first speaker today. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Quinn McFrederick, an assistant professor from UC Riverside. And today he's going to be discussing California bee diversity. And so now, Quinn, I'm going to pass this over to you so you can go ahead and share your slides. All right, let me just poke the right button here so that we have the full screen. So this is pretty amazing. I see that there's over 215 people on the webinar. So thank you all very, very much for, um, for taking the time out. I guess the nice part of this whole thing is that um, uh, it's telling me my internet connection is unstable. So hopefully I don't cut out, but if I do let me know and I'll, I'll do my very best to, um, to make sure that everybody can hear me just fine. 220 people. So I guess that the, the good news in, in this whole thing is that um, is that we're able to come together at least virtually. So that's a, that's a, a, a benefit, a silver lining in this sort of dark cloud. And I like to, I like to start off with this, with this picture because it, it explains a lot about why I'm interested in, in um, solitary bees and, and native pollinators. This bee actually isn't one of our natives, but it is our most important solitary pollinator. This is the alfalfa leaf cutting bee. And it's visiting some alfalfa flowers here. And the reason that I put this picture up is because even if you don't like vegetables and don't like fruits, there's probably not too many of us out there that don't like, um, that don't like at least a good uh, slice of apple pie or, or broccoli or, or, or some of those, those um, fruits and vegetables. But even if you're a strict carnivore and only live off of hamburgers, pollinators are important for you to be able to eat hamburgers. And the reason for that is that we need pollinators to create alfalfa seeds, not for, not for the, the alfalfa hay itself, of course, but to get alfalfa hay, we, we have to have seeds. And the first alfalfa growers actually relied on, on native pollinators for, for the seed set, for them to be able to plant those seeds and, and to grow alfalfa hay. And that was before they started to till. So when they started to till their alfalfa fields, they actually destroyed the, the bee nests that were in their fields and they lost their, their native pollinators. So at that point, they started to use honeybees for pollination for, to get alfalfa seed production. But honeybees are, um, as, as, as Dr. Bayer, as Boris is going to tell us a bit later on, honeybees are actually really intelligent bees. Maybe our solitary bees like the Mega Kylie Roten daughter, the, the alfalfa leaf cutter bee, aren't quite as, as smart as, as honeybees are. Um, I still like to think of them as smart bees, but maybe not quite as, as savvy as honeybees are. And the reason that, that I bring that up, the reason that that matters is because alfalfa is, is a, a really interesting pollination system. You can see right here, these are the anthers, and you can actually see there's little pollen grains on, on this part of the, of the alfalfa flower. Alfalfa is a, a legume or a pea, and it has that typical legume flower where you have a banner, you have wings, and a keel here. And so these anthers are, are held inside that keel until a bee comes and visits that flower. So this flower, this flower, and this flower have all been visited by bees. And the reason we can tell that is because that anther is facing upwards like this. So when a bee comes to visit the flower, the, the anthers are held within that keel. When the bee lands, then the keel pops up and it hits the bee actually. It, it strikes the bee sort of in the face and it covers the bee in, in pollen. So honeybees really don't like getting whacked in the face with those anthers. And that's why they're such poor pollinators for alfalfa. But our, our poor dumb little alfalfa leaf cutting bee doesn't mind getting whacked in the face with those anthers. And so if you use alfalfa leaf cutting bees instead of honeybees to create, um, to do the pollination services um, for, for alfalfa seed, you can get three times the yield that you can get using honeybees. So 
these bees are super important for, for the, the whole alfalfa hay industry. And um, there's a, a lot of seed growers that, that are wonderful alfalfa leaf cutting beekeepers as well. Let me see what I need to do to scroll. So a lot of you have probably heard the statistic, but um, for those of you that, that aren't as familiar with bees, somewhere around a third of, of global food production depends upon animal pollinators. I grew up in the Central Valley of California and I was actually surrounded by, by um, my house was surrounded by these almond orchards on three different sides. And here in California, I, I know that Boris is gonna talk about this a little bit more, but here in California, we have the largest pollination event in the world. And that's this almond pollination event that occurs in February and March, when 60% over 1.7 million bee colonies are brought in. Six, and that 60% of the bee colonies in the United States are brought into the Central Valley for this, to pollinate this crop. So almonds, um, fluctuate between the second and third most important crops in, in, the, in the state of California, the second and third most important commodities. Dairy is always number one. Almonds compete with grapes and those two, those two commodities kind of flip flop back and forth. But it's around a $6 billion a year industry, the, the almond industry is. So this is a major economic portion of, of, of California's, a major portion of California's economy. What some people don't realize is that is that flowering plant communities also really depend upon animal pollinators. So here's a bumblebee with pollen all over its face from visiting this this Asteraceae flower, um, and bumblebees and and solitary bees and honeybees pollinate somewhere between sixty and ninety percent of our wild flowering plants. So that means that bees are actually are, are responsible for the diversity of plants that are out there. And that plant diversity really drives diversity of birds, of um, herbivores, et cetera, et cetera. So you can think of bees as, as what we would call keystone species in ecology, where if you remove bees out of these wild ecosystems, you're going to fundamentally change those, those, ecost those ecosystems. So bees are important not just for our agro ecosystems, but they're also very, very important, of course, for our, for our wild ecosystems. I want to cover a little bit of the, of the importance of, of solitary bees and wild bees in agriculture because that's somewhat underappreciated. And I want to be clear that, that I'm not saying that, that honeybees aren't the most important pollinators for, for agroecosystems because they absolutely are. And, and as, as Boris is going to talk about later on, they're highly manageable, right? You can take those colonies that contain, you know, 30 to 60,000 worker bees, and you can move those colonies onto crops and pollinate those crops. And there's no other bee that you can do that with besides the, the bees in that, in that genus Apis. But we've learned how to manage some wild bees in some pretty amazing ways. And I'll, I'll show you uh, 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 at least one example of that with the alfalfa leaf cutter bee. And on top of that, naturally occurring wild bees are also very important for pollination services. So this was a study that was done about seven years ago, and they gathered data from all across the world looking at the importance of, of honeybees as pollinators or wild bees as pollinators. And so if, we're, if, if the crops in these different geographies are pollinated mostly by wild insects, it's in this purple color. And if they're pollinated mostly by honeybees, it's in this green color. So you can see like here in California, yeah, the honeybee really drives the, the almond crop, for example. But in parts of Brazil, for example, or, or parts of Southeast Asia, um, wild insects are the major pollinators for, for those agricultural crops. And this is just showing the efficiency by which wild insects can pollinate versus honeybees. Um, so there's certain crops like grapefruit and macadamia that are only pollinated by honeybees. There's other crops like cucumbers, um, tomatoes, etc. So both, um, well, especially tomatoes, honeybees aren't able to pollinate tomatoes because these, the flowers for tomatoes are, are pendulant flowers. So they, they they kind of hang down and the bee has to shake that flower to vibrate the pollen out of it. So that's called buzz pollination and honeybees don't do buzz pollination. 
bumblebees and some of our other wild bees are very good at buzz pollination. Um, and that's why tomatoes, for example, completely rely on, on um, non-honeybee pollination. Honeybees just, just aren't able to do that. But even almonds, for example, there's more efficient pollinators for almonds than the honeybee. That's not to say that, that we don't need honeybees to pollinate our almonds. We absolutely have to have honeybees um, for, 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 um, for pollination of almonds. But there are wild bees that when they can do it are, are more efficient at it. So um, Quinn? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. We got a question just uh, that came in. So I wanted to ask it really quickly. Um, when you say the importance, do you mean in economic terms or biologically? Yeah, thank you. And, and please do feel free to, to interrupt as, as I go through the talk. I, I like answering questions um, on the fly. So please feel free to do that. And I mean both when I'm talking about, about, um, about wild bees. So in, in, there have been studies that show the economic importance of wild bees. And so that would, there's a dollar number that I'm not gonna have it at my fingertips right here, but that's what this is showing, the importance for, of wild bees for crop pollination, which amounts into, into that um, economic, in, into dollar figures, right? But I also mean that wild bees drive these wild ecosystems as well. So these wild flowering plants rely mostly on wild pollinators for, those, for, those, um, for that pollination. Like here in the United States, the honeybee hasn't, the honeybees from Europe, the, the honeybee that we mostly use here is from Europe and there's some African genes that have been introgressed into, into our honeybees here in Southern California, but they haven't co-evolved with the native plants here in, in California. So they definitely visit some of the native plants, but the bees that have co-evolved with those native plants, the native bees that live here in Southern California, are usually more efficient pollinators for those plants because they've had that long evolutionary history um, that they've shared with the, with those plants. So I really do mean mean both um, economic and ecological importance for wild bees. So thank you very much for that question. And this is another example of how wild bees can be important economically. So I love this study. This was done in in the almonds. And for those of you that know almonds, there are now varieties coming on that that are self compatible, meaning that um, you can move pollen between the same types of almond trees and pollinate those, those almond trees. So we're not going to need, once those, those self-pollinating almonds come on, we'll, we'll still need bees to, to set the almond crop, but we might not meet, need as many bees to, to get the fruit set that we need for almonds. But right now, most of the almond trees that are out there, you have to get movement from one variety of almond to another variety of almond to, to get seed set, to get fruit set, to make those almonds. So if, you're, if you have honeybees only, what this study showed is that honeybees tend to move down rows and almond orchards are planted in rows. So the honeybees tend to move from variety to variety, which actually doesn't result in efficient pollination. You don't get that much pollen tube growth and you don't get that much um, harvest. You don't get that many almonds on those, on those trees. But if you have wild bees present with honeybees, there's interactions between those bees. So maybe it's just that the wild bees are sort of bumping into the honeybees a little bit more. Whatever it is, they cause the honeybees to move between rows much more often, which means they're moving between varieties much more often. So you get much more pollen tube growth, you get much more fertilization, and you get higher fruit set when you have these wild bees present. So there's synergy between wild bees and honeybees that can result in, in greater prop, crop production in almonds. And that's actually been shown in some other systems as well. And, and I'm, I'm, talking about, um, I'm talking specifically about sunflowers there is the, the study that I'm thinking about as well. So 
all of us sort of know honeybees and most of us know um, bumblebees as well. And I'm sure that many of us have seen like these carpenter bees, for example, but those are just a few species and, and all of those honeybees, bumblebees and carpenter bees are all within this one family, the apidae. And those are just a few species of the 20,000 some named species of bees. We estimate that there's probably about 30,000 different species of bees. And what's surprising to many people is that most of these bees are actually solitary. And so what I mean by that, I, I like to use the analogy of a single mom. So instead of living in like a large family where everybody kind of takes care of everybody else, everybody shares the burden of work, most bees are actually solitary. And that means that, that there's a single female that um, will find a, um, this single female will find a, a nest site, she'll um, build a nest, she'll go and collect pollen, she'll go and collect nectar, and she uses that pollen and nectar to provision her offspring, to, to feed her offspring. So she'll create the nest, she'll, she'll fill it full of food, she'll lay an egg on it, she'll kind of seal off that nest, and for many bees, that's all the brood care that they do. They just collect the food, lay the egg, seal the nest off, and, and leave it. That, those baby bees might emerge within that year, or they might emerge the next year. It, it depends on the species. And where they lay their, where they make their nests varies an awful lot as well. So many of, many of these solitary bees are ground nesting, meaning they dig into the ground to build their nests. Many of them find um, hollow stems, pithy stems, um, that they will sort of excavate out and build their nests in there. Carpenter bees and their relatives, the small carpenter bees, are, are those kinds of bees that they're called carpenter bees because they'll dig out the wood to, to build their nests inside. There's even bees that find, that find snail shells and build their nests inside of old snail shells, for example. But most of these bees, the vast majority of bees are solitary. The bees that we know the best, like bumblebees and honeybees, are truly social. So you social just means truly social. And there's three requirements to be called a truly social bee. You have to have an overlap of generations. And that just means that the mother has to live with her offspring and usually multiple generations of offspring. So like a queen honeybee can live four or five years and there'll be many generations of, of worker bees over those, those four or five years. And so there's a, a lot of overlap between those generations. There has to be cooperative brood care, meaning that there's um, lots of, of individuals that are caring for all of the offspring, that are caring for the entire family. So think about a, a human family where um, there's lots and lots of kids and some of the kids are, are helping take care of their siblings. That would be cooperative brood care. And then finally, there has to be a division of labor for, for a bee to be a truly social insect. And so a, a division of labor just means that there's um, a queen that takes care of the reproduction. There's males in, in honeybees, we call them drones. And in, the, in, the, in honeybees, and um, well, in fact, in, in all of the social bees, the males do very little work. Their, their, um, their job is really just to spread their gametes around to, to um, fertilize other queens and make sure that the, that the family's genes get out there into the, into the world. And then there's the workers. And in, in most of the social bees, the workers are sterile, meaning that they can't lay eggs. Um, and so that's where the di division of labor comes in, where you have a, a reproductive queen, you have males, and then you also have the, the workers, which are usually sterile, but they do all of the brood collecting, all of the care for the colony, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are, I study especially the, the sweat bees, the helictids, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures of helictid nests here in a little bit. In the helictids, usually workers have actually mated but there's policing that goes on to make sure that those workers don't lay eggs. But there are, um, there are eusocial bees where the workers are not completely sterile. And even sterile workers can lay eggs and, and those eggs can hatch and, and become adult bees. But because of the genetics and the way that, that bees reproduce, sterile workers can only lay male eggs. So these, these female sterile workers, 
can never make another female. They can only lay, they can only lay sterile eggs. That's due to the haplodiploid sex determination, which is just a fancy way of saying that if you fertilize an egg, it becomes a female. If you don't fertilize an egg, it becomes a male. So even in honeybees, the workers can lay eggs, but they're always going to be male eggs. They'll never become, they'll never become females. And there is a, um, there's a, just a question for clarification. Um, yeah. Is there a difference between solitary bees and wild bees, or are those terms being used interchangeably? Um, so th thank you for that question, because I do tend to use those terms somewhat interchangeably, but they're not interchangeable, really, um, because there are social wild bees. So bumblebees are a good example of that, and these sweat bees that are, are social are also wild bees as well. Um, but the vast majority of our native bees and our wild bees are solitary bees. So the, and, and the managed bees are both solitary and social. The, the honeybee and the bumblebee, which are major managed pollinators, are, are major managed bees. Those guys are social, but then the alfalfa leaf cutting bee and the alkali bee, which are both managed bees for alfalfa seed production, those are both solitary bees, as are the blue orchard bees, which we're using, we're developing more and more as, as um, managed pollinators. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, so they're, they're overlapping terms, but not completely overlapping terms. There, there are um, social wild bees, and there all are solitary managed bees as well. Okay, so this brings us to our, our first poll question. And if I can ask Peter to, to put this question up. So this question, we're not gonna, um, it's a little bit out of the blue. So, so of course you're not gonna be um, judged by, by whether you get the answer correct or not. But we have a, a few different options here. So I, I would like for you to, 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 to um, choose which answer you think is correct about how you can tell if, if um, a bee is a bee or if a bee is a wasp, for example. Um, it's a bee if it's on a flower. It's a bee if it's black and yellow. It's a bee if it has branched hairs. And it's a bee if it can sting you. So let's, let's, uh, let's go ahead and pick which of those answers you think is best. And I realize that not everybody's going to have all the information they need right now, but um, I just wanted to kind of see what you think here. And uh, while they're answering that, I'll, um, there's another question that came through, so I'll ask this to you. Um, what about the studies that show that honeybees exchange pollen in the hive and cross-pollinate the first few blossoms they visit on each foraging trip? And then um, there's a little extra here. It says, I mean, bees have to move between trees to cross-pollinate blossoms. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's, I actually don't know that study, but I think that's a really interesting point. So, um, you know, bees do communicate, honeybees do communicate inside the colony by, um, by doing the dance, right, by doing a waggle dance. And part of that waggle dance is, is um, physical contact. The, the, the bee that's trying to communicate where a food resource is does this very specific dance and all the other bees that are inside the colony that want to be able to find that same food resource will then um, get close to her and actually touch her with her antenna and such. And so I can certainly see how there could be sharing of, of pollen inside the colony from from the waggle dance, but also just from the close physical contact. You know, if you have 50 or 60,000 bees inside of one colony, of course there's gonna be lots of, of close physical contact. So that's really interesting. I, I hadn't seen that that study before, but, um, and I can see, I can totally see how you could get pollen from different almond varieties by just interacting with, with bees inside the colony. The study that I was that I was talking about a, a little bit earlier, where if you have wild bees present with honeybees, you, you get greater fruit set. That's not so much talking about what happens inside the bee colony, but more talking about what happens on one foraging trip when a, when a bee's outside of the colony. So that's a, a great point that the that the participant that the participant brought up. Um, I think they could both they could both be important. And oh man, you guys are amazing. Um, because 88% of us, 88% um, of us got got this question right. So, 
uh, there's certainly lots of other insects that, that visit flowers. So wasps visit flowers as well. Um, ants visit flowers, flies visit flowers, um, butterflies visit flowers. So bees aren't the only ones that visit flowers. We tend to think of, especially those of us that study bees, <laughs> tend to think of bees as the most important pollinators because they specifically go after pollen. Um, but there's lots of other pollinators out there. Um, there's lots of, of other insects that are black and yellow. Many of them mimic bees so that, they, um, so that they're protected. So there's flies that look like bees and are black and yellow to mimic a bumblebee. Um, bees are the only flower visitors, or, or at least they differ from their very, closely, their very close relatives, the wasps, by having branched hairs. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. And then, of course, ants, bees, and wasps um, can, can sting you. So, so um, bees aren't the only stinging insects that aculeate Hymenoptera all have stingers. So good job. You guys are awesome. Okay, so this is a, a scanning electron micrograph of, of the hairs on a bee. And this is what I mean by branched hairs. So in the wasps, you'll... And of course, you have to sometimes look at a microscope to be able to tell if you're looking at a bee or a wasp. I have to do that myself, um, oftentimes, because they're, bees are really just wasps that have gone vegetarian, is how I, I like to explain wasps, or how I like to explain bees. If you look at the wasp phylogeny, or the wasp tree of life, bees are just one branch in that wasp tree of life, or that wasp family tree. So bees really are just wasps that have gone vegetarian, but all bees have these branched hairs at least somewhere on their bodies. Flies have two wings where bees have um, two pairs of wings, so, so bees have four wings where flies have just two wings. And flies have very different antennae. Their antennae are usually quite stubby. This is a bumblebee and you can see that she has these, um, this antennae that has a crook in it in these sort of long straight antennae. So, so be, uh, flies have very different looking antennae compared to bees. So I'd like to just kind of quickly cover some, some bee diversity. So I, I promised that I'd, I'd talk a little bit about the, about the sweat bees. Um, just a, a question for you guys. How many of you have, if, if you can raise your hand, I think that, that the hand icon is that available to our participants? Has anybody ever been stung by a sweat bee is, is what I'm, I'm curious about there. I've worked with sweat bees an awful lot, so I've been stung by sweat bees many, many times. And I see at least, yeah, we've got at least 15 or so people so far have raised their hand as, as being stung by sweat bees. So I bring this up because there's a really interesting entomologist who's, um, who's, who's named Justin Schmidt who created the Schmidt pain index. So what Justin did is he just had a, a bunch of different stinging insects. Um, he, he stung himself with a bunch of different stinging insects and then just rates how painful he thinks the stings are. So like the bullet ant is the, the, the insect that he rated as, as the most painful of all the, of all the stinging insects. And it's, he describes it as like excruciating waves of pain for hours and hours and hours. Whereas the, the sweat bees, he describes their sting as, as the least painful of, of the stinging insects. And I love the way that, I love the terms that he uses. He uses light and fruity, um, like, like a fine white wine, for example. So their stings really, um, sometimes you can't even tell that you've been stung immediately and then the, a little bit of pain comes on a, a little bit later, but they have a very, a very light sting. They're called sweat bees because they're attracted to salt. And so on hot summer days, if you're out and about and you're, you're really sweaty, sweat bees might land on you and, and start to drink your sweat for the salts that are, in there, that, are, that are in your sweat. There's both solitary and eusocial sweat bees. And they're abundant and they're very species rich. So there's, there's over 4,000 different species of sweat bees. Here in North America, we have at least 500 excuse me, we have at least 520 different species of sweat bees. This is one that doesn't occur here in California, but occurs on the East Coast that I studied during my PhD. So really a beautiful bee. This is, is a, a sweat bee that does occur here in California. This is Helictus legatus. 
this sweat bee, Argochlorpura, is, is solitary. This one forms small colonies. So their colonies never get above like 20 or 30 bees. And for my PhD, I, I kept these bees in, in the laboratory. So this is what, um, they're ground nesting bees. They make their colonies underground. So they dig out the dirt. And they dig out these little chambers. This is a bee right here, and she's dug out these chambers. This is the pollen provision, so she's collected this pollen and nectar. And that's an egg laying that she's laid on top of that. So she'll seal that off and then go build another one. You might notice this yellow color right here. That's a secretion that the bee uses to, to waterproof the inside of, of this, what we, we call this a brood cell, this chamber that she builds to lay her, to provision her offspring and lay her eggs in. So that waterproof lining kind of protects the bees from, from moisture in, inside the soil. So those are, those are the sweat bees. Another major family of bees are the megachylid bees. So this includes our friend, the, the alfalfa leaf cutting bee here. So that's that bee that was, that was introduced from Europe um, accidentally and, and we've, we've learned how to manage it here in North America. All of the megachylid bees are solitary. So these are all, um, these are all single moms basically. And again, they're very, very species rich. There's over 4,000 species of megachylid bees. And here in North America, we have about 630 species of, of megachylid bees. I like to, well, here comes the entomologist joke. I can't, can't help myself since I am an entomologist. I like to put up this picture of this behind. Yeah, I know it's terrible, I'm, I'm sorry. Because this is one of the defining characteristics of, of the megachylid bees. So most bees, you know, collect pollen and have to bring that pollen back to the nest. And they use those branched hairs to, to carry that pollen back. And I put up this picture of this behind because you can see all of these hairs on the, on the underside of her abdomen. Those hairs are what she uses to, to carry pollen. We call this the scopa. And in megachylid bees, the scopa or the pollen carrying structures are on that underside of, of the belly, the underside of the abdomen. So they're the only bee that does that. So if you see a bee flying around that has like a bright orange or a bright yellow abdomen, or just the underside of the abdomen, that might be a megachylid bee. So try to take a closer look and see if it's pollen that's giving it that bright color on the underside. If so, you know that it's one of these megachylid bees. And this is what a megachylid nest looks like. So they tend to nest, this varies, some of them even nest underground. Some of them nest in those snail shells that I mentioned earlier. But um, some of them, many of them nest inside of wood. So they find old beetle burrows, for example, and they use those old beetle burrows, beetle burrows inside the wood to create their own nests. So here's a larvae, here's a larvae, here's a little partition between these cells, here's a larvae, and here's another larvae. And you can see that this bee has cut all of these leaves to seal off the entrance of the nest here. So this was just a piece of wood that I split in half so that you can see the inside of it. Now the leaf cutter bees are called leaf cutter bees because they'll cut leaves. Here, here this bee is cutting a petal, but it's a spectacular color is why I use this picture. And then they'll take those leaves back to their nests and they'll use those leaves to, to create either the linings inside the, the partitions inside the nest, or um, they'll completely enclose each of the brood cells inside of leaves. So each of these is a separate brood cell containing a separate, um, a separate pollen provision and a separate egg inside of it. And this is just a larvae that's feeding on it here. And I like to show this, this is what my lab studies, we study, um, all of the tiny organisms that live inside of bee nests. And you can see that there's some fungus growing inside of this. So this larvae is, is, is um, racing to be able to eat all of this food before this fungus overtakes the, the food that her mom is provisioned for. This is a, a slide showing you the alfalfa leafcutter bees. So they're solitary bees. It's just a single female that, that collects the leaves, builds the nests, and, and does all of the pollinating. But we've learned how to manage these bees so that we can get them in massive numbers to pollinate these alfalfa, these alfalfa fields to get alfalfa seed. So the, each of these boards has many, many of these, of these tiny holes in it. And there could be 
a million bees, for example, um, inside of this one enclosure in the middle of this field. So we've learned how to manage this bee in massive numbers, even though it's a solitary bee. So that's truly, truly remarkable. This is showing you the inside of a nest, and, and this is actually what we call the frass, so that's bee poop. We just use a nice name. As entomologists, we call bee poop frass. And this is the larvae itself. So these are little fat bodies, and this orange part is the larval gut. These are many different brood cells, and we manage this bee by breaking up the brood cells, um, refrigerating them over the winter, and then incubating them when we need them to emerge to pollinate these alfalfa, um, these alfalfa flowers. So this is one single brood cell and you can see that, that it's wrapped in these different colored leaves so they can make these very beautiful brood cells. In my lab, we like to work with these bees because these single brood cells fit very nicely into these plates that are made for a completely different purpose. These are tissue culture plates, but they fit these brood cells in it very easily so we can do large experiments with these bees very, very easily. And this is just showing you once again this same picture of the bee gut. And here's, I, I've dissected off this bee's gut. And you can see all of the pollen that's, that, that this bee is using for, for nutrition. So here's another poll for you. So now that we've learned a little bit about how bees collect pollen and, and what they look like, which of these two images is a bee? Is it A or B? So let me know. Yeah, just a question for you while they're answering. Um, any brood diseases associated with these solitary bees in brood tubes? Oh, that's a fantastic question. I love that. Yes, um, the alfalfa leaf cutting bee um, is its major its major pathogen is called chalk root. The disease is called chalk root, and it's a it's it's a closely related fungus to the fungus that causes chalk brood in honeybees. In honeybees, it's called Ascosfera apis is, is the name of the fungus that, that causes honeybee chalk brood. In the alfalfa leafcutter bee, it's Ascosfera aggregata. So it's a different species. Um, it doesn't infect honeybees, but it infects megachylae rotundata and it affects other related megachylae as well. So that's the major pathogen. There's lots of wasp um, parasites that also can attack um, these, these managed megachylae rotundata as, as well. So those are the two major problems that the, that the alfalfa leaf cutting beekeepers face. Great question, thank you. And again, you guys did really well. So 76% of us got this right. The reason that we can, so, and I see why, why about a quarter of us said A because this thing really looks like a bee. So this is one of these flies that mimic bumblebees. Flies, of course, don't sting. So they've evolved to look like a bumblebee because if you're a bird and you see this black and white, or I'm sorry, black and yellow pattern, you're gonna think bumblebee. When I was a baby bird, I ate one of these and it stung me in my mouth and it really felt horrible. I'm not gonna eat this. Well, this is a fly and so it has no stinger. So it, it really helps it to look like a bumblebee. You can tell it's a fly because it has these stubby antennae. If you could count the wings, there's only two wings. It doesn't have a structure to carry pollen, whereas this bee has these bee-like antennae. You can't really tell that it has um, two pairs of wings or four wings, but you can see that it's got these big um, balls of pollen that it's carrying in its hind legs. So, so that also helps us know that it's a bumblebee. So, um, so excellent work there. I'll close this poll. And that brings us to the family Apidae. And I know I need to, I need to move a bit more quickly, so I'm gonna talk a bit. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna be so talkative and try to get through my slides because I have a few more things I wanna show you. The Apidae is, is another very large family with about almost 6,000 species worldwide. In North America, we have about 1,000 species. That includes these longhorn bees. So this is a male that has these really long antennae and that's why we call them longhorn bees. These are squash bees. So if you ever have any sort of squash, if you have pumpkin or any kind of cucurbit in your, in your garden, you're gonna attract squash bees. These are specialists on squash and they're great pollinators for pumpkins and other squash. Mm -hmm. But the apidae also includes some really interesting bees that are, that are what we call kleptoparasites. So this is one of those bees where you would really have to look at it closely to know that it's a bee. 
this is actually a bee, but because it steals, that's the klepto part, it steals pollen from other bees, so it finds other bees' nests and lays eggs inside that other bee's nest. So this bee doesn't collect any pollen itself. It's lost any structures to collect pollen, but it's a bee and we know it's a bee because it still has those branch tears somewhere on its body. So you might have to get it under a scope to see those branch tears to know that it's actually a bee. The apidae also include, of course, the most famous bee, the honeybee as well. And then the last family that I want to tell you about is the andrenid bees. So these are our bees that are active right now. These are also hyper diverse. There's 3,000 species worldwide. Where I live, there's a, a huge diversity of these bees. And in North America, there's about 1,200 species. They're all solitary. We call them the spring bees because they emerge very early in the spring. And I put the pictures of these faces because this is how you can tell them apart from other bees. They have these, these indentations on their faces that we call facial fovea. And andrenid bees are the only bees that, that have those facial fovea. Here in, in Southern California, these bees tend to be specialists. So they might visit um, Laria, the, the creosote bush, for example. There's lots of, of andrenid bees that are specialists on Laria, for example. Hyperdiverse, some of them are very, very, very tiny. The smallest of the bees are, are found in this family. So I do want to. Um, touch a little bit on, on some of the bad news about, about wild bees. And for a while, there was a, a bit of controversy about whether wild bee species were declining or not. Now, most bee biologists will tell you that yes, the wild bee species are unfortunately in decline. This was one of the very first papers to show us that. And this is showing um, bees on the left-hand side. And if it's red, that means that there's a, a decrease, a loss of species. And if it's blue, that means there's an increase in species. And what you can see is across Britain and the Netherlands, there's been an overwhelming loss of bee species. Yet again, of these surfids, and these surfids are flower visiting flies. So we've lost bees and we've replaced them with flies, which are pollinators, but they're not, we don't think of them as, as being as good a pollinators as bees. So there's been multiple studies that have sort of verified this finding that across the world we are losing our bee species. We think that that's mostly driven by land use change, by, by loss of habitat. But for, for honeybees and for other bees as well, there's novel pathogens that humans have moved around. There's um, poor nutrition that's driven by land use change. And then there's also these, these newer pesticides that many of our, our um, pest control applicators have, have, have interacted with, especially these neonicotinoid pesticides. So for a long time, there was controversy about how hard these were on bees. I think that this study was, was really the best study that really convinced a lot of us about, about what was going on here. This was done in, a, in oil seed. This was done by, by a, a woman named Maya Rundolph, a, a really excellent scientist. Um, I, I've met Maya a couple of times. She's a fantastic scientist, really great work. Um, she studied these fields in Sweden where half of them had um, the, the seed coating and half on, on the, the neonicotinoid seed coating on the oil seeds so that, that that systemic pesticide gets into the pollen and nectar as the plant grows. And half of them didn't have that, that um, pesticide. So this is a field study that was done using real fields out in the wild. It was funded by Sweden. It wasn't funded by any um, pesticide company or anything. And what she found is that the density of wild bees was much lower when you use that seed coating on the crop. Bumblebees had fewer, so um, the white I think is females, the black is males. And if you look at the control versus seed coating, there's fewer female cocoons and there's fewer male cocoons as well in these seed coating areas. The uh, megachylid bees that nest in these tubes did nest in the control fields, but there was no nesting at all in the seed coated fields. And what was really interesting is that honeybees, there's no difference in, in, in how well the honeybee colonies did strength wise in these two fields. So we think that the explanation we think is that honeybees have these large colonies, they can move very far. So they might have different 
a, a better ability to make foraging decisions outside of these fields than these solitary or small social um, colonies that you find in bumblebees have. So that might be the, the colony might buffer it and that large workforce might also introduce fewer of these of these neonicotinoids into the honeybee colony. Um, that's a one possible explanation. Okay, so we have one more poll. Which one of these guys is a bee? So, um, and do we have any any new um, any new questions that I can answer as we're as we're going through this? Um, we have a few. I'll just ask one because I know we're getting short on time, and we want to make sure we um, get to Boris's presentation. But this one just came in: um, why some areas are showing an increase. In, oh, in, in, in bees, yeah. So I don't, I don't know the, I think that is referring to the, the map in the UK where there were a few little blue dots. And I don't know for those exact dots, um, but a possible explanation, um, and you can see this on the East Coast as well, is that there are, um, there are some farmlands that are returning to wildland. So I lived in Virginia, for example, and, and Virginia is more wild now, I would say, than it was 50 years ago. There's been more reforestation. And so that's a possible explanation. You know, I think across the world, we're deforesting and we're, we're um, paving things over and we're, we're putting agriculture monocultures into our agricultural land much more than we're letting things go back to the wild. The human population is obviously growing, but there are certain patches that are returning to wild states. And so that might be driving those little blue patches. So again, that's a great, that's a great question. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Beautiful. So 81% of us have the correct answer here, which is A, and then 19% of us. This is actually a wasp. And again, it's a little bit difficult to tell, but if we got these guys under a scope, we would see some branched hairs on this. And you can kind of tell that because these hairs look kind of fuzzy on this bee. But this is another one of those kleptoparasitic bees. So it doesn't look quite as bee-like as some of the bees. And I just put these up because just to illustrate that it is actually really difficult to, uh, to tell sometimes whether you're looking at a bee or a wasp. So I would say that 81% of us getting that right is, is actually spectacular. You guys are, are very, very good bee biologists already. So thank you for that. Okay, so I wanna just end by talking about the kind of work that we're doing here at UC Riverside. We actually have a, a large group of, of bee scientists at, at UCR. Boris is one of those scientists. He studies honeybee health, but we also have several labs that are really working to try to help the bees. In my lab, as I mentioned earlier, we study these, these things that live inside of the nests with bees. And so we're actually really interested in bacteria that live these bee colonies and how they interact. We don't see coronavirus, but since uh, everybody's thinking about coronavirus, I thought this might be a good visual. We, we, we're interested in how these bacteria interact with bee pathogens, how they interact with environmental toxins, and how those pathogens and toxins feed back into the microbial communities. And event, what we're really after is, is how that affects the health of these developing bees inside of the nests. We're just one of those labs though. Lauren Panicio is, Lauren is especially good at, at, at data science and, and using, creating and, and using these very large data sets to understand pollinator health in agriculture, to understand these networks of interactions. So how plants and pollinators interact with each other how wildfires affect pollinator communities, and then really looking at pollinator communities over time and, and assessing the, the risk of extinction. So we're, we're very pleased to have Lauren here. Nicole Rafferty's lab is really focused on the effects of climate change on both flowers and what we call flower phenology, when flowers emerge, their size, what kind of food they make, and how climate change affects bee biology as well, their foraging activity when they emerge. And so she's shown that there can be these mismatches. Climate change can cause bees to come out at different times from their flower hosts. And so she's really interested in how climate change affects that mutualism between bees and flowers. 
Erin Rankin is an invasion biologist and trophic ecologist. She's most known for her work with, with wasps, but she's done an awful lot of work with, with bees as well. So she's interested in ecological factors underlying the, the successful invasions, impact of species interactions on food webs, um, including pollination and predation, and impacts of migratory species on resident communities. So Erin and I studied, for example, how migratory honeybee colonies affect the, the prevalence of, of pathogens in resident bee communities, for example. And then finally, Hollis Woodard is our, is our um, bumblebee biologist. And what Hollis studies is um, she mainly focuses on bumblebees, but she's branching out into other, into monitoring of, of other wild pollinator populations. She's studying the, the challenges that bumblebees queens face when they overwinter the regulation of brood development. So these are social insects and, and work together to rear their young how taste influences floral preferences. She's really focused a lot on, on queen bumblebee physiology and, and biology and the molecular drivers of, of foraging behavior. So we have this really diverse community that, that, that works together, this really diverse human community that works together to help protect the diverse pollinator communities. So I think that I, I will end there with a, a picture of a very beautiful orchid bee and, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Quinn. So just a real quick question for you. Um, is there a good source of compiled information uh, of which native or wild bees pollinated ag crops effectively? Um, yeah, so I would, I would say that this Garibaldi paper from 2013 um, so this was in Nature. Garibaldi was the, the first author, and, and that was really the largest study that I know of that's, that's looking at the efficiency of, of wild, the efficiency and the contribution of wild um, bees to agricultural pollination. Um, so I, I think that that can be behind a firewall sometimes, but if anybody wants to contact me directly, I could send that paper to them. We have your slide up there, so there's your contact information. And so now um, I want to get started with our next speaker. So our next speaker today is uh, Boris Baer. And he's a professor and honeybee expert from UC Riverside. And he's going to be introducing and discussing the effects of pesticides on bees. So Boris, if you're ready, you can go ahead and share your slides and get started. Well, thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, that's a remarkably big crowd. And um, I hope you can see me at the moment. And you can also see the background, because um, that is actually a picture that my grand grandfather uh, drew uh, 1907. <clears throat> and he chose the house that he built. It's the house that I was born in. And as you can see in the background, um, it, it's the house is surrounded by a big orchard. So he was a big fan of planting all sorts of different uh, trees. <clears throat> and uh, so we had like continuous kind of supply of, um, veg uh, of uh, food um, throughout the year, right out of our own garden. But the, the reason why I show you this is that um, apparently I have a very strong accent. So um, uh, I'm not American or um, uh, Australian. I'm... Um, uh, I'm originally from Switzerland. So Switzerland has really cold winters and I really hate winters. Uh, I can't stand them. And so every spring, all these kind of trees went into flower. And when I then went out of the house after these long and gruesome winters, I could hear the, the bees in the, in the trees. There were white, the white blossoms and there was the, this buzzing sound uh, of all these types of different bees, honeybees, but a lot of other types of bees. And I could even smell them. And then a couple of weeks later, I would find um, bumblebee nests in our garden. So I, I refer to that as the golden age of bees. So <clears throat> I'm focusing my talk uh, really on honeybees. And the, uh, this love relationship between honeybees and humans is not that didn't really start when um, when I was a, 
a small boy. That rough relationship between bees and um, humans is really, really old. Some archaeologists date that back uh, almost 40,000 years ago when people kind of started to climb up into trees or uh, <coughs> into um, cavities and they started to harvest honey. And you can see that here on this picture, how uh, um, it's about 10 to 15,000 years old from a cave in Spain. And you can see kind of people that have climbed up probably in a tree here and they harvest the honey. Uh, if we move a little bit kind of forward, if uh, we reach the uh, ancient, ancient Egypt, that's uh, 5,000 years ago, the Egyptians already had a fully functioning uh, um, honeybee, um, uh, uh, honeybee kind of setup. So they kept bees, they harvested honey, um, they even kind of moved honeybees uh, around uh, on the Niva wild, so depending on what was in flower, um, the, the, the bees kind of uh, were transported to those areas where there, uh, there was something on flower. And uh, there are many reasons why you keep bees, and I can't go too much into that, but uh, of course, like the key aspect of honeybees is that uh, they, they pollinate, and Queen has already kind of covered that to a certain uh, uh, degree in, in his talk. What I want to kind of point out is that if you look at the honeybee, the honeybee is really like an amazing super pollinator. If you have a hive, um, if you have a hive in your backyard, these bees can fly out up to 10 kilometers or six or seven miles. So it's a huge kind of area that a single hive can cover. And um, a single bee can um, forage up to 1,500 flowers on each trip. And while doing that, as you can see on this picture, and Queen also referred to that, we have these hairs here, and the hairs actually pick up the pollen. So if you kind of look at the fully grown uh, honeybee hive with about 90,000 bees, where half of the bees typically go out and forage for nectar and for pollen, we can make some rough estimates that a single colony um, Cumulatively, like the, the, the uh, foragers, they kind of transport their pollen around for about 450,000 kilometers each day, and they can pollinate up to six, more than 6 million, uh, six million uh, flowers. So that's a lot of pollination. So that the honeybees really kind of have that, that punch to kind of produce or to provide mass pollination. And that was really important because if we go uh, a little bit further ahead and we look at the Green Revolution, which started about 1950, uh, which was kind of a movement to really industrialize agriculture. Um, and the reason for that is, of course, that we want, all want to have more and we want to have cheaper food. And if you look at like your disposable incomes or the money you can spend uh, on things, um, you have never spent as little money on your food uh, than, than ever before in history. So we have a lot of money now left to buy iPads and expensive toys and new cars and things like that. If you would have lived in the mid ages or before this, um, most of your income would have been used up uh, buying food. Um, and so by today, uh, and uh, the Queen also mentioned this is like, more than 80 crops of agricultural interest require pollination or about a third of what we eat needs, needs uh, insect pollination. And so that has become uh, really valuable. Um, you can see this here for the United States, it's about estimated to be 29 billion US dollars per year and on a world uh, wide scale, it's something between 240 and 580 kind of billion dollars each year that like the, the value kind of provided by, by bees. And that's, and I assume many of you have seen this or know that that's specifically important for California, uh, which is a powerhouse of agricultural produce, especially the Central Valley um, uh, that produces uh, uh, annually something around uh, $8 billion of, of agricultural products. And uh, the key uh, example that is normally kind of used to illustrate that uh, are, of course, the almonds um, as of Today, like 80% of the global produce of almonds is produced in the Central Valley, and that uh, value is actually going up because there are more and more orchards coming into production. And that needs an insane amount of bees. So about 1.2 million hives are shipped from all over uh, the US uh, into the Central Valley to provide that pollination, uh, these pollination services. And the US has only about 
seven million hives. So a large portion of the hives, the managed hives that the US has to be transported to the Central Valley to provide, to provide these services. And so that had like quite dramatic effects on the way we keep bees and, and on beekeepers. So what we have is we have commercial beekeeping these days. So it's not like that the farmer has a little bee house uh, <coughs> somewhere on his property with like a few hives. You now have commercial beekeepers and they have thousands to tens of thousands of hives. I think the largest commercial beekeepers in the US, they, they maintain something like 60,000 hives. And you cannot keep these hives all the time in the Central Valley or around these crops because once these crops have uh, finished flowering, there's nothing to do for the bees anymore. So as a, an effect of this, um, we have the uh, beekeepers becoming migratory. So they put their uh, bees um, on trucks and you can see here that's a barge and on that barge there are about six, 600 uh, individual beehives um, and they're transported to, uh, to an offshore island um, uh, or, or, or even over, over water but um, for pollination kind of purpose we even put bees into uh, the bellies of airplanes and we ship them uh, over, over the continents. Now if you maintain so, uh, so many bees uh, you have to replenish them, you have to requeen them, uh, you have to maintain them. So that has resulted in queen breeding programs or uh, specific beekeepers uh, focusing on the production of queens. Um, and that like influenced like the, the, the amount of genetic diversity um, that, we, uh, that we have in, in, the, in the managed bees that we, that we use today. So that was all kind of part of the green revolution and you can ask like so what did the green revolution really do for bees and you can have a look at like the development of or the, the number of hives that are, or were available over uh, the green revolution or since the green revolution in the US and that's shown here so you can see here from 1946 so after the second world war and I kind of just added here for 2019 the number that we had and what you can see is like it's kind of a steady decline in the number of managed types that, that are available. So it looks like the bees were not overly happy uh, over that time period. Um, and will that continue in the future? Well, I, I assume that some of you have seen this graph here, which basically is um, a survey that is now done on a yearly basis to look into um, uh, the losses of, of beehives uh, uh, by beekeepers. And you have three bars, you have the gray bars. These are actually the acceptable winter losses. So that is what uh, would be sustainable over longer periods of time. And then we have in yellow here, we have uh, the amount of hives, the number of hives, the percentage of hives that has been lost. And in orange um, from 2010 onwards, we can also see uh, the, uh, the losses uh, during the, the year. Um, so what you normally kind of compare is the gray ones, the gray bars with the orange bars. And what you can see here over the last years is that like we continuously lose more bees uh, than, uh, than would be sustainable. So we are running out of bees and the question is, is this only a US kind of phenomenon? And it actually isn't. So we see such kind of dramatic decline, declines, not just in the US, but we see them in, uh, in other places as well. What happens if we completely lose the bee? Well, that's a bit of a horror scenario, but there are some regions, uh, for example, in, in southern China, where the bee has been completely lost. And what we see there now is that uh, they try to re, uh, replace the bee with humans. So you have a woman here, she collected pollen uh, from apple trees and she has that pollen here in a, in, a, in a little jar. And then she has a specific uh, stick with a brush and she's actually pollinating these apple trees by hand. And you can imagine for uh, a country like the US, it's just kind of economically you not know, kind of sustainable to, to poly pollinate the, uh, food crops like this. So the big million dollar question is then like what is really harming our bees and unfortunately the answer to that is not that easy. Um, a, a number of kind of a lot of research has been uh, conducted over the last 10-15 years into this so we have a fairly good idea by now of what, what the problems are. The first problem that bees have are clearly parasites and the parasite that you can see in this picture here is the most famous one. It's a mite, it's called the varroa mite. 
Um, but it's not the only one. Uh, in fact, like um, bees actually have uh, remarkable, uh, remarkably lots of diseases. And I showed this to you here on, on this slide. So this is like a, a slide that shows you um, the number of parasites on one axis here. And we look here at different kind of social insects, so different ants, bees, um, and, and wasps. And uh, you can see that like for most of kind of the, the species that we have studied social insects, um, they only have a single parasite here. So 270 or so um, species of, of social insects, they only have a single parasite. And then for a few others we have like, we see that they, they, they harbor more parasites. But on average, um, a social insect has like, let's say three parasites um, that, they, that they harbor. Now, where are the honeybees on that? Honeybees are exceptional because we, by now, we know more than 40 different parasite species. So this is completely off scale. You can see that my graph here basically ends at 20. So you would have to double that. You would have to have a second slide added to add the, 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 the honeybee to this. And the reason is why there seem to be kind of um, uh, uh, biological um, reasons for that, that honeybees harbor more parasites, but there are also kind of uh, reasons that are uh, coming more from the way we uh, treat bees or we keep bees, because we uh, basically transport bees around a lot. We brought them into areas where they are not native, so they picked up a lot of diseases from, uh, from, from, from other bees, for example. So uh, a substantial number of diseases that we have now in honeybees are not originally honeybee diseases, but the bees still have to cope with these and um, have certainly not really developed natural levels of resistance towards these parasites. So a second problem that we have is environmental change. And I think there are two aspects to that. First of all is that like the climate is changing and um, that impacts uh, flowering periods of, uh, of trees and that uh, uh, can interrupt um, the, uh, the, the performance of a colony. Uh, Quinn mentioned uh, that we have Nicole Rafferty uh, here at UCR and she actually studies this type of um, aspects. But the, the other thing that um, is really important when we talk about environmental change is of course that we kind of also as part of the green revolution, like we really changed the landscape. So this is kind of a canola field somewhere in China. Um, and you can imagine like that bees might not necessarily be overly happy in, in, such, a, in such an environment. Um, it's a very monotonous food um, and bees like actually kind of variation in food. So they are kind of confronted with very different types of environments than they were 50 years or 100 years ago. A third kind of factor that certainly plays a role is like the way we kind of manage pollinators and honeybees these days. We, uh, I, I mentioned that before, <coughs> uh, we uh, kind of breed them to sp specific tasks. We carry them around a lot. So pollinator management has resulted that bees are generally more stressed uh, because of all these kind of, uh, kind of demands that we have on the bees. And uh, stressed bees are eventually kind of, um, uh, uh, will get to the brink where they, where they also kind of start to collapse or you can see like the negative impact on the colony. And the last um, thing that I want to mention here are of course pesticides. So <clears throat> we grow more and more food. Uh, we have monocultures, really large monocultures. And it's clear that like growers need to protect the crops. Uh, otherwise that will be eaten up really soon. And um, originally, like what you can see here in this picture is that like these uh, pesticides or insecticides uh, would be applied, for example, through an airplane or, <clears throat> or while the crop is growing. Um, what has uh, been developed and used over the last uh, two or three decades is what we call like systemic pesticides. So in, in that case, we have seeds that we coat with a pesticide and uh, the pesticide is then combined with, uh, with other um, molecules that actually kind of increase the uptakes and, um, and, and effectiveness. We then kind of plant this. Um, so there is a, a plant that um, evolves from that and the plant takes, ap takes up the, the pesticide so the pesticide re uh, resides inside the plant rather than being sprayed from the outside. So if a Baddie is coming along and starts to attack your crop, 
um, they basically eat um, the uh, insecticide with the food and basically uh, then kills, uh, kills them. Um, and, and that was, of course, the entire uh, idea behind this. Um, in order to make this happen, um, there were kind of two kind of uh, things that need to be developed. First of all, the pesticides that uh, were developed had to be really stable because they have to reside um, in the plant for a very long time. So the application start is actually kind of applied before you see it. And like the, uh, the, the uh, pest insect attacking is that, that happens uh, much later. Um, and, and the other uh, kind of thing that need to be developed is that these insecticides needed to be really, really uh, efficient. So relatively toxic because um, of course the, the concentration of these pesticides are, are, are relatively low in the plant. So once the, uh, the, the pest takes it up, it has to be very efficient in killing the pest. Now, originally the idea was that like this would not really impact uh, the flowering and that these pesticides would not show up in pollen and in nectar. But um, as we became better in measuring these things, we realized that they actually, uh, that you can find them, uh, not in uh, tremendously high uh, concentrations, but these pesticides are present in uh, pollen and in nectar. So if bees uh, collect them and, um, you can see here like um, Queen really kind of covered that really well, right? If like, the bees kind of being able to kind of collect these pollen paddies. Um, these pesticides can be transported back in the hive. And the question then was like, what are the effects of these pesticides on the colony and on colony performance? And I think like what we know by now is that uh, in most cases, if the pesticides are um, applied uh, correctly, that it doesn't kill straight away the colony. But what emerged certainly over the last couple of years is that we have what we call sublethal effects. So these pesticides are there and they have effects such as the bees having problems to navigate, the bees having problems to communi communicate with each other. There are also indications that queen bees seem to be more susceptible to the to kind of the exposure to of these uh, pesticides compared to the to the workers. So there are effects on the colony, and then the question is like, what are the what are the consequences of of, of these of these effects on on colony performance? It certainly kind of induces additional stressors to the to the colony. We know that and that has I think that has been shown really nicely. What also happens is that. Um, because the bees continuously bring that back, we have an accumulation of these pesticides. So if you start to analyze, for example, wax, which really absorbs this type of toxins, um, we now have like, uh, we, can, we can find more than 50 different uh, pesticides um, in, 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 the, in the brood combs. And in some cases, the concentrations are so high that you actually have to kind of get rid of, of, of that material because it is too contaminated. And um, if it's in the combs and if it's like if the bees carry it home, there's always the risk of cause of food contamination because we're not only using the bees um, to pollinate, we also kind of harvest honey. So some of these kind of molecules might actually through the honey go, get back into the human food chain. And uh, it's clear that like, um, like the beekeepers, of course, and also the consumers not really happy about this. There's a specific kind of um, uh, type of pesticide that has been used really, uh, uh, really widely and is still used really widely. Um, and that are the, the nicotines and, um, or the neonicotinins. Uh, and the um, Queen has already kind of mentioned them. I, I'll go a bit further into the details of what they are. So, you know, nicotine, and if you're a smoker, this is actually what you're looking for. Um, the, Tobacco plant is actually not producing nicotine so that you can smoke it. The tobacco plant is producing it as um, uh, a pesticide. And it's interesting that until the mid ages, humans actually used nicotine uh, as a pesticide in agriculture. What has been done is uh, to fulfill the criteria that I mentioned before about this kind of systemic pesticide is that um, it was basically taken in the lab and, and modified. So we have here two neonicotinoid insecticides um, that are used today. 
And um, you can see here that like we have this wing here uh, with six um, atoms and this, this wing here with five. And that basically is very similar of what we see here in, in these in this, in this other kind of substances that are, uh, that are uh, were produced as insecticides. And um, they are kind of artificially produced in the, uh, in the lab. So they are not really kind of occurring naturally. And that means that they are not so easy to kind of degrade. And for some of them, the problems have been that like if they degrade, that the, the, the degrading products are actually kind of more toxic and especially more toxic also to, uh, to non-insect uh, uh, pest species. So the neonicotinoids have come quite a bit under pressure. Um, and as like there were a number of kind of uh, um, publications coming out that actually kind of showed sublethal effects or even lethal effects of these, of these substances on, on non-target kind of organisms. And that has started um, in an increased kind of banning of these uh, molecules um, or of these substances. Uh, I don't know whether you, you are aware of that, but for example, the European community has completely banned now three of the most widely used kind of uh, neonicotinoids. So it's unclear where this goes in the future, uh, but it's clear that like insecticides impact um, uh, pollinators and, and they stress them. So these are kind of the four um, uh, stressors that um, are the, the four stressors that I think like are responsible why we see this kind of decline in, in, in honeybee health and, and the losses that we see. Um, unfortunately, um, the thing becomes a bit more complicated than that because they're not independent from each other. And I'll show you an example of some work that we have done um, to kind of get a bit into this. So what we did is uh, in our lab, we are typically kind of working uh, mainly on parasites. Uh, but in this case, we, uh, we combined uh, our parasite work with pesticide work. And what we did is like we uh, selected some colonies and we were feeding them. We were either feeding them with pollen uh, that you can just kind of provide them in the hive. Or we uh, provided them with pollen that was spiked with a neonicotinoid, which is diamethoxam. And we use the concentration that is substantially lower than uh, a lethal dosage. Is, it was also substantially lower of what we measured in the field. So that's a very, very small dose. And once the animals hatched, we kind of did four treatments. So we either kind of uh, just uh, looked at the animals alone, or we also kind of infected them with a parasite. So you can see here a pipette and inside here, these red bubbles, um, these are actually the baddies, these are the, the, the parasites. But both for the, 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 peri the uh, pesticide and the parasite, we use dosages that are typically not lethal for bees. So they, they should kind of cope with that. And we have then four treatments that we compared with each other. We have a control treatment that just got really good pollen, but was, got, did not get infected and was not exposed to a pesticide. We have bees that got uh, stressed with a single factor, so either with a parasite or with a pesticide, and we have bees here on, on this end here, and they, were uh, they had to kind of deal with, with both of these, uh, of these stressors. So the question then is like what happens, and we can look a bit at the data, so here for example we looked at male mortality, and uh, down here we have these four different kind of treatments, and if you look at the data this is what it looks like, so if you have like bees that are not exposed to a pesticide, you can see some males die, maybe a few more if they're infected or not. But if like the males are exposed to this pesticide at, at very low concentrations, uh, you can see that they, the mortality of the males actually goes up quite a bit. And that was a bit surprising for us because um, typically this type of work is done on workers and workers seem to be better able to cope with these pesticides compared to males. So such an effect is quite dramatic because if you start to lose males, that has very uh, dramatic consequences on if, if you want to kind of breed bees or if you want to propagate bees. Another thing that we looked at for this experiment was like how kind of efficient the immune system is running in these bees um, because um, the immune system would uh, define like how efficient they are to kind of uh, fight off the disease that we gave them or other diseases that are around. So this is what we found here. 
So what you can see is like, we have a kind of the control here shows like a very nice strong immune response. The immune response is declining a little bit when they get infected. But if you have bees that have been exposed to the pesticide, the immune response overall is actually lower. An interesting thing that we find here is that the decline actually increases. So you have a decrease in the uh, bees that are non-infected by the pesticide, but that becomes steeper here. So the, 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 the loss or the, the, the reduction in immune response is actually becoming bigger when the bees have been exposed to the pesticide. We call that a synergistic effect. It's like an additive effect would be one plus one is two. A synergistic effect is one plus one is five. So the, the two kind of factors over proportionally kind of contribute to an effect that we see. Now we repeated that type of experiment and we also wanted to know like if we have uh, bees that develop in a hive and these bees are fed with pollen that is contaminated, will that still impact them later in life when they hatch? And we found that to be the case of so bees that are were fed with non uh, lethal kind of dosages of, of pesticide during their larval development when we measured uh, the, the, their immune kind of response or the, the uh, expression of some uh, genes like uh, immune genes uh, three weeks into their life we saw that was, that was actually that was also reduced. So we have also long-term effects so we have synergistic effects, we have long-term effects so an exposure of a bee early in her life to such a pesticide can still be measured at the end of the bee's life. So it, it actually carries through. So um, the pesticides have been like a big issue, um, very controversial, very emotional. Um, and um, that has been sometimes maybe productive, but maybe not all the time very productive. Um, I think um, the, the key issue here is that um, independently of whether we talk or you talk to growers, whether you talk to beekeepers, conservation people, or even the pesticide producers, they're all united in one um, single cause and that nobody wants to have dead bees. Um, and, and so I think like the, the, uh, the idea at the moment is to actually look forward uh, to see how to resolve some of these issues. And I think like um, that's quite interesting because right now I sense some form of movement where I think we are heading into a second green revolution. So after the first one, there's a second one coming up. And I cannot fully call this, but I can give you some of the ideas that are floating around that I find very interesting as, as ideas. The, the first one uh, that I would like to mention is that like um, looking at like whether we should adjust our growing methods. Yeah, and I show you a picture here, I think it's from Iowa, where uh, they grow crops, but you have these kind of uh, stretches of prairie in, 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 in the middle that attract pollinators and also would maintain pollinator health. And similar kind of things happen in the Central Valley where there are kind of experiments running at the moment to try to kind of grow hedges, for example, next to, to uh, almond orchards to try to kind of um, uh, uh, support pollinators. The second thing that I would like to mention is that, that we're becoming really good at monitoring. Um, and there are two kind of different aspects of that. We either have, for example, drones that can monitor um, crops and if they find or detect something, they can basically then, in a, in a more kind of uh, uh, restricted area, they can apply, for example, a pesticide. So rather than uh, you treating your entire crop, you're only treating those areas that are actually affected by, uh, by a parasite. But we also start to developing, and that's really kind of uh, uh, advancing really fast at the moment, that we even would have sensors either in the soil or on plants, such as trees, and these sensors monitor the health of the trees. So that uh, like you, you would not treat trees that are healthy, but you would get, or the, the, the grower gets uh, an alarm uh, once um, a parasite infects or once a tree becomes sick. So I think there are kind of interesting opportunities uh, to explore. And then there's of course like the crops themselves. So there are kind of all sorts of ideas around like that we should, uh, um, uh, rotate crops, that we should use different genetics of crops, that we should modify the genetics of crops. So there is like a lot of discussions of what, what the opportunities are. 
And as you can imagine also like what the possible dangers are if we, if we kind of proceed these kind of rules. Then there are kind of um, quite a number of um, uh, activities to try to protect the pollinators. Queen has already mentioned some. Um, more, most recently, for example, there was a really interesting um, study that came out where people modified bacteria and fed them to bees. So, and these kind of uh, modified organisms in the gut of bees uh, seem to protect them against some of, uh, of, of, of these pesticides. So that like, it's like, it's a bit like an immunization, but it's not an immunization, but it, it would be, it's, it's the idea that like, we, if you modify the gut microbiomes of these, of, these, of these pollinators, that that could actually be really helpful to, uh, to uh, safeguard their health and their pollination services. And then that's something that is maybe not kind of completely new, is like whether there are opportunities to move away from uh, chemical pesticides, more into biological control. Um, I hope that this gets revived again um, and that like that that would be kind of a, also a good opportunity in the future to um, uh, to kind of uh, protect pollinators. So that's more on the grower side and maybe on the side of, uh, of uh, big companies producing crop protection plans or something like that but there's also the bee side right and um, so there's also work I think that needs to be done by beekeepers and by researchers like me working in, in the bee world. And um, the reason is that like, if you look at agricultural uh, important um, animals, domesticated animals, or just pet animals that we have around us, we are typically really good at keeping them healthy, right? So you, if you have a dog, if you have a cow, if you, if you have a horse, um, you go to the vet um, and the vet basically checks the animal, vaccinates it, or if the animal becomes sick, you go there and, and a veterinarian can actually fix it up. And the veterinarian science are really advanced. We have hundreds of different medications for domesticated animals. Um, and, and that has really improved the health of domesticated animals and, and, um, and how we keep them. Now for bees, that's completely different. The veterinarian sciences have never really taken up bees. And so our opportunities at the moment um, to treat bees, to recognize problems are really, really limited. So one of the things that, that I'd like to mention here is that um, we talk to veterinarians and try to kind of convince them they should do that, but they were not overly um, enthusiastic about this. So we came up with a different idea. And our idea is that we have here a, a beehive, which is really happy, uh, but bees and their societies, um, they communicate with each other and they communicate with, with, with each other with smells, with pheromones, so if something happens to the hive, that changes things inside the hive. And we try to kind of, we try to smell into that. So um, we have kind of um, sensors that we start to build and these sensors basically monitor molecules inside the hive that, that are important. For example, a very simple kind of one is that it, as long as a queen is in the hive, the queen uh, releases a, a queen pheromone so the workers know that mom is there and mom is laying eggs. If that pheromone disappears, you know that the, the colony is in trouble because they have lost the queen. But we can also kind of smell into, into other parts. Here I use the example, for example, that mites come along and, and change like these, uh, these, these pheromone bouquets in these, in these hives. And then the idea would be that the sensor actually kind of is able to detect such a smell and then uh, uh, contacts, uh, in this case, for example, the, the beekeeper and, and, and worms in. Now, um, it's a complicated um, thing to put, uh, to kind of develop this because you need biologists, you need chemists, you need engineers. Um, the really tricky thing uh, for, to, de to develop such central systems for bees is that the, the sensors need actually to be clever. So it's not enough if you just kind of measure endless amounts of data and you, you send them to the beekeeper because the beekeeper has not the time and, and to kind of analyze or that to kind of realize what's happened. So the clever sensors need to kind of gather that data, do the analysis of the data by themselves and then decide whether or not they send an alarm to a beekeeper. 
Now, it, it sounds a bit all like Star Wars and, and far away in the future, but we're actually playing around with this type of sensor. So we have a third, a third generation of sensors now that we try to uh, deploy into hives. We have big plans for this year um, and um, somewhat cynically kind of a disease basically shut us down. <laughs> So um, at the moment, not much is happening, but as soon as like uh, we get over this coronavirus um, tragedy, um, we are back in the VR and we will continue to kind of develop these type of things. So this is what I had to say. Um, that's it from, from my end. Um, if there are any urgent questions from your end, I'm really happy to kind of answer them. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, listening to me. So I think we have several of your poll questions that we can put up at this point. Yeah. So can you see that up there? If you want to read the question, maybe in the responses or... The, the question is, honeybees are responsible for the pollination of 15 to 20 crops, eight, more than 80 crops, eight crops, or more than 150 crops. Uh-huh. All right. So most of you got it right about uh, it's over 80 agriculture crops. I brought this up again because uh, it's actually interesting that uh, a lot of the crops of higher value are actually pollinated by bees. So we, we, if we lose the bees, we still have um, uh, the grains, but the really kind of uh, healthy and, and, and good foods, uh, berries um, and, and things like that, they are, they are pollinated by, um, by, by bees and that depends on the crop. So if you have something like almonds, really 100% you need like insect pollination, other crops can still kind of uh, fertilize through wind or other um, measures. But um, given that we really have to maximize food production, the bees really kind of give that extra kick to produce these crops. Yeah. So do we have another question? Yes. So the question is, okay. which statement below is correct? Honeybees have fewer pathogens compared to other social insects. Honeybees host more parasites compared to other social insects. Most honeybee diseases have been artificially introduced by human activities uh, and D, both A and C. Yeah, so most of you got that right. 60% um, got, got that right. Honeybees uh, host much more parasites compared to other social insects. Um, the average social insect has, I don't know, three or four. Uh, honeybees have, as I said, more than 40, and we're still kind of finding them, or there's still new ones uh, jumping over. It's true that like um, a number of parasites have jumped uh, from other kind of um, animals and other bees, uh, Asian bees, for example, to honeybees. But the majority of the diseases that we, uh, that we see today are still kind of original kind of parasites from, uh, from, from the honeybees as far as we know. Yeah. Do we, do we have another question? So I read the question again. Systemic pesticides are toxic substances that only kill pest insects, toxins that are taken up by the plant and reside inside them e-friendly insecticides or those banned from use in agriculture. No disagreement here? Okay, yeah. Do we have another one? Yeah, so in the absence of bees, almonds still produce a crop, but only about a third of what they produce with insect pollinators. Is this true or is it false? Most of you um, got that right. Uh, almonds are a little bit special in the like how completely dependent they are on pollination. <laughs> um, other crops really differ. Um, sometimes it's only a couple of percent that like bees kind of contribute towards uh, uh, more yields. Sometimes it, it's more substantial than that. And as Queen has shown, sometimes it even depends on bees. So we have like honeybees that are really specific, that are specifically good at pollinating some crops. And then we have like bumblebees or solitary bees and uh, they're actually much more efficient uh, on, a, on a per bee basis to kind of pollinate the crop. I think the, the, the honeybees where the efficiency comes in just the, the sheer numbers that, that, that the, the honeybees can provide per colony uh, to provide pollination. <clears throat> Do we have another one? So um, the last question is, the pollination services of bees are specifically important for the production of healthy foods such as vegetable and fruits, the production of key crops such as wheat and rice, ecosystem stability or both A and C. Yeah, so that's really, most of you got that. 
the answer was D. And I thought that's a really nice question for the end because it combines like uh, Queen's talk with my talk, right? So I was more maybe on the agricultural side. Queen really made a really strong point that like bees and their pollination services and especially non-honeybee pollination is really important, not, not just for food, food production, but also just like to, to main, maintain ecosystems. So, um, uh, so that like uh, we have uh, seed production uh, by by plants, natural ecosystems, but that also provides food then for all sorts of animals, birds and, and mammals and so on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It looks like um, that's all of the questions we had and I think we're at the time. So thank you all for presenting and for being on our panel. I think this was really a great session and I think it went pretty well. We didn't have any audio issues, so I think all of that was great. We hope everybody has a great rest of the day.